Ladies and gentlemen, may I have uh, your attention once again. This next session that we are going to have is a critical one, like has been said. Africa as a continent has eight regional economic communities. And the next topic of discussion is about regional security collaboration. And those eight regional economic communities are all represented here. And we hope after the session, the plenary, going into the question and answer, as well as the breakout sessions, we are all going to learn from each other on how these regional economic communities can collaborate for the purposes of regional security. I sincerely hope that each one of us enjoyed our dinner last night. As we get into the topic of discussion this morning, which is best practices for regional security collaboration, may I take this opportunity to introduce the moderator for the session. The moderator for the session is Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Peary. Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Peary is a devoted and charismatic army officer with over 17 years experience. He's currently serving in the Zambia Army as Deputy Director at Zambia Army's Public Relations and Foreign Liaison Directorate. This is the appointment he has held since last year, 2023. Throughout his military career, he has served in several positions, including Civil Military Coordinator or Coordination in Sudan, ABA, Public Information Officer in the Zambian Battalion deployed in the Central African Republic and in Sudan, DAFO, as a military staff officer. Lieutenant Colonel Piri has directed and moderated at several army and other military-related functions in Zambia. He is a critical he is critical in coordinating public affairs activities and other beneficial engagements for the Zambia Army with key stakeholders. He has done all courses that are commensurate to his rank, the last being his senior command and staff course at the Defense Services Command and Staff College, Kamwala, in Lusaka. Lieutenant Colonel Piri is a qualified computer systems engineer, graphics and web designer, as well as a qualified public relations practitioner. Ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together for Lieutenant Colonel Arthur Piri. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. Land Forces Commanders, Summit participants, good morning. It is a pleasure to be here today to discuss the vital topic on regional security collaboration. In an increasingly interconnected world, the need for robust partnership and effective cooperation among nations has never been more evident. Our collaborative security rallies in our abilities to work together, share insights, and implement best practices. I am honored to moderate in this panel where we have the opportunity to exchange ideas, explore innovative approaches, and ultimately contribute to a safer and more stable world. Let us delve into discussions with enthusiasm and commitment to finding actionable solutions. My panel this morning, Professor Kwesi Anning from Ghana. Colonel Mumbi Mulenga, 
Zambian based in Tanzania. Brigadier General Dr. David Suva Sanene from Zambia. We will give the panelists 10 to 12 minutes in which to make their presentations, after which I will invite Land Forces Commanders to share their experiences. Bio for Professor Kwesi Anning. Kwesi Anning is a full professor and director, Faculty of Academic Affairs and Research at the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center. With experiences from the African Union and its first expert on counterterrorism from 2005 to 2007. Professor Aning wrote the first independent mid-term in-depth evaluation on the global program on streaming on legal regime against terrorism in 2006 and 2014. In addition, he also wrote the United Nations Secretary General's report on the African Union relating to peace and security for the United Nations Security Council in 2008. Until January 2019, he served on the United Nations Secretary General Advisory Group for Peace Building Fund. In 2020, together with two others, he was joint author on the conflict and development analysis. July 2022, he was appointed member of the World Food Program's Security Advisory Board to provide high-level insights on security risk management technical issues on strategic level and modernize the World Food Program risk management to deliver safer operations. He specializes in peacekeeping economy, economies, hybrid security, political orders, peace building strategies, and organized crime. Valued participants, it is clear that Professor Aning brings a wealth of experience and expertise to today's discussions. The second presenter, Kenel Mumbi Mlenga, enlisted in the Zambia Army in 1994, and in 1995 he was commissioned to the rank of second lieutenant and attested the Corps of Armour. In his 30-year military career, he has participated in internal security military operations, as well as four peace support operations in Africa under the auspices of the African Union and the United Nations. Kene Omlenga has studied military courses at home and abroad relevant to his career progression, and that includes senior command and staff course. He has a degree in law from the Zambia Open University, a master's degree in peace leadership and conflict resolution from the University of Zambia. Currently, he's based in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, where he's serving as coordinator at the Sadiq Regional Counterterrorism Center. Distinguished participants, given Kene Omumbi Mulenga's extensive experience, I encourage our audience to take advantage of this opportunity to engage in meaningful dialogue. The last presenter, Brigadier General Dr. Davis Suva Sanene, joined the Army in, on 17th January 1987. He has enjoyed an illustrious military uh, career spanning over 37 years. He has served in several appointments and his current one being Army Secretary at the Zambia's Ministry of Defense. He has a doctorate of philosophy in defense and security studies, his research being a, a model on integration of the military in the electoral process to curb violence using lenses of hermeneutic phenomenology. He also has a master's degree in defense and security studies, a degree in logistic and transport management, postgraduate diploma in lecturing and teaching methodology, and a diploma in French teachers' courses. Besides civil courses, Brigadier General Dr. Sanene has also studied several military courses relevant to his rank and commensurate to his appointment. He has authored several articles, including the role of key stakeholders in military in, in, 
in elections and administrative and logistic roles the military can play at pre, intra, and post stages and is about to launch his book on the dynamics of peace operations, a case study of the Zambia Defense Force. He has participated in several military operations, both internal and external, and he was recently awarded the prestigious Presidential Medal of Guarantee. Distinguished generals, valued participants, I'm sure we are all eager to hear from Brigadier General Dr. David Suvasanen and benefit from his unique insights. Let us now jump into the presentations as I invite to the microphone Professor Kwesi. Land Forces Commanders, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me say a very good morning to all of you. This morning I have the distinguished pleasure of talking about best practices for regional security collaboration. Let me begin by stating clearly that regional security cooperation particularly in the context of finding regional solutions to transnational problems, have come to stay and will continue to become a feature in multilateral security politics. Finding regional solutions to transnational problems is something that we have all overlooked for a very long time, precisely because of the focus on the domestic aspects of issues and challenges that certainly did have a regional dimension. Regional security collaboration has become an, an essential feature, I argue, of finding solutions to broader international security challenges. However, not everything can come under such cooperative frameworks. Most cooperative arrangements will focus, I will argue, on two critical components. First, on shared values and on shared norms. That is what brings us together in the first place. The second relates to identifying what is commonly shared and agreed amongst the, the members of that cooperation group as to what their identified threats are. But equally importantly, it's about the promotion of regional security dialogues, a human security agenda, the consolidation of democracy and human rights, certainly the deployment of peace operations, but also, as I've said earlier, a shared perception of actual and perceived threats and the efforts to contain such threats. For this morning's conversation, I will focus on the economic community of West African states. ECOWAS is key, I would argue, similar to other regional organizations. But next year would have been 50 years of fanfare. Right now, ECOWAS is facing an existential threat and three of its most important members in the fight against terror have decided to quit the organization. So how did we get here? A group that voluntarily came together and established a set of binding frameworks disintegrates just when it's about to celebrate uh, uh, 50 years. As you are well aware, the period between 2020 to 2024 has, be, has posed existential challenges to this organization, with disintegration as a possibility and echo exit a reality. Echo has reached a crossroads, is walking a tightrope, and undertaking a balancing act that I would like to speak about. 
So this morning, I want to speak about two, two things. First, a discussion of best practices based on the ECOWAS experience. And secondly, the impacts of the effectiveness of such regional security cooperation. So first, a couple of points about the best practices. First, for regional security cooperation frameworks, the best practices relate, I would argue, to distinguishing and concentrating on specific or joint problems that threaten the cooperation in all forms. So in ECOWAS, it's about small arms flows. And before terror became a problem, it was about corruption, lack of democracy, respect for human rights, the rule of law, the criminal networks that underpinned the theft of lumber, small um, small scale mining, flora and fauna. Two, it is about ensuring compliance. One is for a collaborative framework for 15 heads of states to meet, to sign on to documents, wine, dine, and dance with taxpayers' money, and then refuse to comply. And I think in the ECOWAS case, the lack of compliance by those who append their signatures to these documents created a two-level and two-speed organization that when it comes to the political interests of the political class, they are above the rules. And then, of course, when they misbehave, then the land forces would be used either to quell domestic riots or to intimidate member states that you will intervene. The third is about ensuring reliable exchange of information and knowledge. That then ties into the fourth point about intensifying confidence, building trust, and understanding amongst member states and their citizens. More often than not, regional cooperative security frameworks make rules, regulations, decisions in which member states and ordinary citizens have absolutely no clue. So in all my travels in, in, in West Africa, it's actually fairly common to see some of these documents being used to wrap either roasted plantain or yam. But the fifth point, which I think is key, is to stringently enforce, monitor, apply, and verify the rules and guidelines underpinning these cooperative arrangements. So if we take the issues around democracy, as a plank in deepening cooperative frameworks. We notice in West Africa the unwillingness of ECOWAS to apply the rules relating to unconstitutional changes of government in the consistent, transparent manner that shows the extent to which these rules are being applied. And therefore, cooperative frameworks and arrangements work best, I would argue, when the rules that bind them are applied in a manner that compliance becomes consistent over time. Bindingness is key here. You know, so we need to move from the rhetoric of signing on to documents with a fanfare to the hard nitty gritty work of saying, how do we ensure that we enforce this? And I think it is that lacuna, that incapability to apply the rules consistently that has brought ECOWAS to where it is. Furthermore, 
We know that historically, regional security cooperation is driven by actual or perceived threats and efforts to contain all the issues that can pose a, a danger. So if we take ECOWAS once more, the panoply of security-related frameworks from small arms, from terrorism, from narcotics, to issues of fauna and flora are massive, very impressive on paper. The capacity, however, to consistently enforce and to punish is no more than leading this organization to become a rhetorical organization. The second relates to what must be done and what, how can we test the effectiveness or otherwise. And I think there are several questions that we can ask around this. First, to what extent do these organizations address and reduce the, 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 either the risk or the frequency of the disputes that routinely will arise in any cooperative arrangement? Two, to what extent do they have an impact at all in the regional uh, rivalries that arise? And I think here we need to be clear that the impact of regional cooperation frameworks will continue to vary greatly from one framework to the other. But let me end by talking about two things very briefly. And I think there are two dynamics that we need to focus on. One relates to the institutional aspects of such frameworks, and the second, the political aspects. Let me start with the political aspects first. Politics drives the manner in which cooperative security frameworks work. And I think yesterday the president was very clear that when the political leadership is consistent in its application of the rules and they send people who are smart, qualified to run the institutional aspects, then we have a coherence of views that is capable first of identifying what the challenges are but most certainly also in responding to them. My argument with respect to ECOWAS in particular is that the lack of application of its own principles and the lack of a pragmatic approach to responding to the challenges that the cooperative security framework faces has led to what I've put on the slide here. Every single country part of a patchwork of cross-border security cooperation frameworks. It raises a fundamental question about what the norms are, about what the values are, and about how the institutional strength to, to deliver on what they have agreed to can be done. So final point, if we take the Accra Initiative, the Accra Initiative has Burkina Faso, uh, Benin, La Côte d'Ivoire, Ghana, Togo, Niger with Nigeria as, as a, a, an observer. But Benin, no sorry, Burkina Faso, Niger and Mali have either been suspended from the ECOWAS larger framework, or they themselves have decided to form the Alliance of Sahel States. But they are members of the Accra Initiative that primarily seeks to share intelligence to be able to respond to the challenges that we are facing. So where are the shared norms and values that says you cannot join the ECOWAS framework, but you can join the Accra Initiative framework? And we can go down the list and raise particular questions and concerns. So institutions do matter, but institutions work best 
when the application of their norms and principles are consistent, transparent, and then speak to the points and the challenges that they face. Otherwise, members of that framework will continue to do things that suits them that in the long run undermines the efficacy of that cooperative framework. Thank you. Thank you very much. Distinguished generals, ladies and gentlemen, let me begin my presentation by thanking the Commander Zambia Army and the Commander U.S. Army Southern European Task Force Africa for extending this invitation to me to be part of this summit. It is a great honor for me to be here to share my thoughts on best practices for regional security collaboration. And I'll begin my presentation with, with a question which land force commanders will not answer, but I'll provide the answer. Why do nations choose to come together and form regional communities or regional bodies? The answers may be numerous, but for the purposes of this discussion, I've identified two main themes that guide countries in coming together to form regional bodies. The first one is security cooperation as a primary objective. Here, member states pursue security cooperation. And some of the examples that fall under this one include the Organization for Security Cooperation in Europe, OSCE, the Southern African Development Community, SADC, and NATO. If you take a critical look at the history of these three regional bodies I've referred to, what comes to the fore is that they were influenced by security considerations more than anything else. Then the second category is the general purpose regional bodies. These are primarily motivated to pursue such objectives as agriculture and food security, regional and economic integration, and trade, among others. And in this category, we have bodies like the Economic Community of West Africa, ECOWAS, that was founded in 1975, and at that time, Almost all the member states had already attained their independence. Then we have the East African Community, ESC, and the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, IGAD. Again, a detailed study of these three regional bodies I've given as examples here reveal that they were influenced by issues other than security. However, what is also true about this second category of bodies is that they are also concerned with security. And within the treaties that establish these organizations, they embed aspects that speak to promoting factors of security, such as stability and conflict avoidance by encouraging integration among the member states. Let me now narrow down onto Southern Africa, or SADC, and speak to some security vulnerabilities in the region that inform all the security frameworks, or the regional security frameworks that are in existence under SADC. These vulnerabilities are not exhaustive, but they would provide a good platform for this summit to engage in discussions. The first one is inadequate legislation to fight transnational crimes, crimes such as terrorism and human trafficking. These are fast-paced crimes 
and most member states either have legislation in place that is not speaking to the threat or do not have anything at all. And in this case, member states are invited to enact laws that will speak to this vulnerability. The second one is perception of marginalization and practice of social exclusion. This largely speaks to how some member states practice their politics, where political parties are formed on certain identities, could be regional identities, could be religion identities, or even class identity, to the extent that when such political parties form government, they engage in developmental activities that tend to exclude individuals or regions where their perceived enemies come from, political enemies for that matter. The third one is lack of effective and consistent sharing of information. This is one aspect that our chief guest yesterday, the President of the Republic of Zambia made reference to. It is a very big challenge for SADIC, and um, if I can cite a few examples, as I was introduced, I'm heading the SADIC Regional Counterterrorism Center, and two years back, member states agreed that they will be submitting national threat assessments every three months. But in the last two years, I can share with the summit that out of the 16 SADC member states, I only get not more than five. At the time, these are supposed to be submitted. So the land force commanders can take advantage of summits such as this one to identify challenges that surround issue of information sharing. The next one is inadequate cooperation and collaboration between regional bodies and non-state actors, or even governments and civil society organizations. This is a relationship that continues to be shrouded in a lot of mistrust. On the basis that some governments have argued that these non-state actors are sponsored by organizations or governments that have an interest to save either in the region or in a given country. At SADC level, attempts have been made to assimilate non-state actors into the mainstream SADC frameworks to broaden the information collection base, but very little success has been made in this regard. The last one is weak border management. Again, to tap into the address that was made by the president, we were informed that Zambia and DRC, for example, share a boundary of about 1,900 kilometers. Now, it's practically impossible to man the entire expanse of this boundary. That is not even the worry, but there's evidence suggesting that Exist, sorry. There's evidence suggesting that some of these bad elements actually cross or move between countries in the region using established crossing points undetected. So even before we consider portions of boundaries that are not manned, there's already a problem with established crossing points. I'll now share with the summit the best practices that I identified for this discussion. There are six. The first one is creation of regional security mechanisms among member states to bring them together for a common purpose. In this regard, SADC in 1996 established the organ on politics, defense, and security. This is the organ that is charged with the responsibility to promote peace and security 
in Sadiq region. And under it are committees embedded. One of them is the Interstate Defense and Security Committee, whose chair actually is in our Mideast, Lieutenant General Adibuzwe. And these, or rather, this is the committee that advises the ministers of defense and ministers of internal security of the SADC member states. They are mandated to sit at least once a year or as and when there is a need. The second best practice is transparency and inclusivity. Obviously, this will assist to build trust and confidence among member states and obviously over assist in overcoming the challenge of information sharing. The third one is deepen interoperability through joint training. This training, I must appeal to the land force commanders that it should not be the joint training that will generate suspicion and unhealthy competition between member states. Rather, it is supposed to build a regional force that is capable of responding jointly to threats in the region. And in that regard, SADC has held several joint exercises at regional level, including Exercise Blue Crane that was held in 1999 and co-hosted by the Republic of South Africa and Namibia. It was a brigade-level exercise that was based on a multinational UN peacekeeping operation. Exercise Gofini was held in 2009, hosted by the Republic of South Africa. It was another peace support operation exercise. And most recently, Exercise Umozi that was hosted by the Republic of Malawi in 2018. This was a command post exercise that was designed to exercise member states in planning and conduct of peace support operation. The next one is information sharing. Information sharing is, is very easy to talk about, but if I can bring it in practice, it's extremely difficult to implement. When we gather in meetings like this, it, it, it's quite easy that we can share one or two things. But the moment we go back to our capitals, we bring in bureaucracies that tend to come in the way of information sharing. I will not dwell much on this one. It was talked about yesterday. Then commitment from member states. This speaks to the political leadership of each member state that should demonstrate unwavering commitment to regional endeavors. SADC was recently put to test with regard to this best practice. When there was a call to deploy in the northern part of Mozambique, Cabo Delgado province, to neutralize terrorist elements in that area. The deployment, uh, the operation was sanctioned to deploy on the 15th of July, 2021. And as we speak, the drawdown has begun, and yet we could not raise the required military capability. That was measured to be enough to respond to the threat in the region. Similar challenges were experienced in the recent deployment in Eastern DRC. Raising of military or required military capability remains a challenge. And in this regard, I want to borrow to what Dr. Kwesi just spoke about when he was on the podium. These are arrangements that member states decide and even escalate them to the summit level where presidents are sent to such deployments. We sit down and 
engage member states to contribute the required military capability, we reach a deadlock. The last one is mutual respect for member states. This, in my view, should be the anchor best practice because it's a basis for regionalism in the first place. And this should not be determined by such things as population size, territorial size, or even economic considerations. A member state should just be a member state. So distinguished generals, those are the six best practices for regional security collaboration that are identified. In conclusion, distinguished generals, I would want to state that transnational problems or crimes are inherently complex and fast-paced. They are ever-evolving, and the bad elements perpetuating and profiting from them have no regard for international boundaries of our respective countries. This places an inordinate demand on new land force commanders to support information sharing, which is one of the most critical best practice using existing regional security mechanisms. Further, in your interface with the political leadership of your respective countries, you may impress upon national leaders to strike a balance between pursuing narrow nationalistic security agenda versus regional security arrangements. Distinguished generals, one thing is certain. Regional problems can only be solved by or can only be cured by regional solutions. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Uh, I would like to recognize all the land forces commanders who are here, the, the host the, and the co-host. Um, thank you very much. Unlike the speaker yesterday, who was a retarded general who could pass around, I wear two hats. The first hat is that of a saving officer, and to pass around the generals here, I fear that I'm still amenable to the military justice system. But the second hat that I wear is that of an academician, and therefore, much as I'll try to bracket myself from certain realities, I will still bring out one or two issues openly for the sake of inciting the great minds that are here today. My fear is that with all these great minds today, the academic world will not tap and get their um, learned experiences, and they'll get back to their, ho to their hometowns, home countries, without us retaining anything. As an introduction, I've given some quotes And for the, in the interest of time, I will not go through those quotes. L'homme est la mesure de toutes choses, des choses qui sont ce qu'ils sont, et des choses qui ne sont pas ce qu'ils ne sont pas, by Platagoras. L'instabilité de l'Afrique est déclenchée par milliards de raisons, notamment notre patrimoine, notre histoire et notre économie. Si vous les comprenez, vous pouvez les gérer. L'instabilité quelque part, et l'instabilité partout, par le président Ichilema, et la force de l'Afrique réside dans son unité, bah, par le général Todd Wasmond. 
Nous sommes formés pour trouver des solutions aux défis et non pas créer pour défis des problèmes. By Geno Alibouzoui. And the last one is that les, me les meilleures sagesses à avoir, c'est de savoir que je ne sais rien. That's my introduction. As background, there is a shift in paradigm from the traditional security cooperation that we used to have, which was based on the hegemon between the two worlds. That was the Cold War time. But now we see more and more of security integration at regional level. Data had been analyzed to prove that a number of military alliances have now dwindled and we are um, focusing on regional integration. We have regional cooperation increase in the Pacific Islands with the United States region, cooperation through the regional economic communities as already mentioned by the previous speakers. This is what we are focusing on now. The most important feature of these changes is the simultaneity or simultaneous decline of prominence of military alliances. During the Cold War time, each one had to belong to one region or another, to the super uh, uh, boys at that time. But now we are looking at integration between the region and the cooperating partners. A regional security partnership is the security arrangement on an international region that originates from intergovernmental consensus to cooperate on dealing with security threats and the enhancement of stability and peace in the region, as we have heard already from the previous speakers, and this, and this uh, intertwinement uh, 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 frameworks are through formal treaties, international organizations, joint action agreements, and others. To just define it a bit, a regional security complex depicts a set of units in which the major processes of securitization and desecretization, or both at a go, are so intertwined that their security problems cannot reasonably be analyzed or resolved independently of each other. That is from the academic continuum and it is just to, to, to stress what we have been talking about. The concept of regional security is understood as effectively implemented protection of the system of mutual relations between countries in the region against threats of instability, crisis, armed conflict, and regional wars. Regional security institutions are often, but not always, established on the basis of geographical boundaries. We have countries here belonging to SADIC, and the same countries are belonging to other economic groupings like COMESA. So you find that you have one group which also expands to join another economic grouping for certain interest, in, interests. And to analyze regional security issues, we need to look at such as well. I already talked about geographical scope. Then the element, the, in most post-war, international systems often cover an area larger than the region in strictly geographical economic terms. Elements of threat are outbreaks of war, and these have already been outlined by the previous speakers. I'm just plagiarizing now from the professor and the kennel. To just give it a nexus, a theoretical underpinning, the theory of regional security complexes provides a conceptual framework that encompasses on emerging new post Cold War international security order. It, process, it proposes a model of regional security which makes it possible to analyze, explain, predict the development of the situation in a given region 
But based on this assumption, that is the regional level, not the global or the level of a single state, but you find that researchers have to continue refining these theories to, to encompass the current regional security trends, such as what we have today, drought, we have transhumance issues, which were not originally in the original theories. The theory of systems also, which looks at what affects your neighbor, affects, or what affects yourself, affects your neighbor, as already uh, elaborated by the previous speakers. But without boring the commanders with theoretical frameworks, they are, theirs is a pragmatic approach to solutions. So I will not dwell very much on theories. Commanders don't require theories, but to give it an underpinning that for commanders here, if we were to place this on a theoretical or a philosophical continuum, the commanders should look at pragmatism and phenomenology because the commanders here have lived experiences which we need to tap from. And phenomenology may appear to be too big, but it just means what are the lived experiences which we need to learn from the commanders here today and maybe to interpret them uh, uh, which is uh, hermeneutics. The United Nations perspective, however, says the Security Council encourages nations and regions and sub-region organizations to strengthen their cooperation to prevent and resolve conflicts, improve collective security, and maintain international peace and security. From the Accra conference uh, last year, it was emphasized that Security Council uh, recognizes that region, regional and several regional organizations are well vested to understand uh, the root causes of conflict. These can stem from ethnographic issues. They can stem from cultural values. As you may see, or as you know that, what is in the eastern part of Zambia is the same culture in Malawi and that's the same culture in Mozambique. So you cannot divorce this from security uh, uh, integration. These have to be looked at as well. So there is a symbiotic relationship between uh, uh, regional security and cultural issues uh, at national levels. Collaborative efforts are also crucial in the wake of environmental and natural hazards, such as volcanic eruptions and, the, and, and what has already been mentioned. And to just look at a few factors, for, for us to look at this security integration at regional level, we need to understand the military potential of the states within that region. There are other militaries which are weak, not saying weakness in a pejorative way, but weakness because of uh, resource allocation and equipment. And the quality of management of the defense security sector in a certain region. The character of borders between countries of a region and the external ones, that is the geographical, and the political and military alliances of the region, as Professor Quincy mentioned. One of the factors here is the role of non-state armed groupings, which we have seen that it has impacted negatively. You, well, you may call it positively again, that is up to the commanders here to know from which continuum they are looking at it, but we cannot talk about regional security integration without looking at the non-state armed groupings, some of them being financed and fueled from overseas which come to bear on our security issues. And we cannot mimic them and keep quiet as, as if they don't appear. The commanders seated here know about it. It is happening where we are deployed. It's happening at Sadiq region. It's happening at ECOWAS region. And we have to talk about these issues. The nature and dynamics of strategies adopted by participants of the international state systems in a region also are some of the factors. What are the best practices, therefore? These have already been itemized by the first two speakers. Information sharing has been already uh, mentioned. At SADIC level, 
the commanders are here, they should tell us, and they will talk to each other how it was to deploy in, in Mozambique. It has been mentioned, and we saw a challenge of information sharing which impacted negatively on the operation in Samim. Organization of joint uh, uh, technical training exercises to help uh, build interoperability. Again, it's one of the best practices that has been mentioned. Inventory past experiences in conflict uh, prevention and management is also one of the best practices. I was just being informed by uh, the previous speaker that there will be an after action re review for the SAMIM. And these are the best practices so that we learn from the weaknesses that we identified in that, uh, in that mission. Building legitimacy, regional organizations must effectively support states dealing with this again was mentioned by the previous speaker. Engaging parliamentarians, again it was mentioned because whatever resources we need have to pass through our, our parliament and therefore they need to be brought on board. We cannot discuss these issues without involving them. They are the ones who provide the resources. Establishment of regional monitoring centers, again it was mentioned. Encouraging the private sector to fund regional organizations. We, again the previous speaker mentioned issues of resources. We know that certain troops deployed in certain missions, governments could not uh, meet the pledges that they made to, fi to fund uh, these uh, regional, uh, 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 regional deployments. And these are challenges, and so we need to look at them Engaging the media to raise awareness. Also, it's one of the best pra practices. Uh, institutionalizing mechanisms and approaches based on previous ad hoc experiences. Um, strengthening human and technological capacities of regional organizations. Examples, again, we are given on ECOWAS. I will not talk about it. But again, it is up to the generals seated here to tell us, or to be frank, and tell us whether the way ECOWAS intervened in Sierra Leone in 2000 when we were deployed there as ECOMOG is still the same way ECOWAS can intervene in any of the countries that they need to bring consensus at regional level. It's up to the generals here to tell us whether that is still possible and that we can still map them, do a mapping and get best practices from them as a region because they have had a lot of experience and we need a lot of best practices to learn from ECOWAS. They started it way, way long time ago. We have just implemented it now recently at SADC level. Southern Development Community, I talked already about uh, these best practices. We saw deployment in, in, in Sudan, which gave birth to a hybrid mission in Darfur. We saw the deployment of Lesotho under Samil, deployment again of intervention brigade in DRC, deployment of SADC force in Mozambique, uh, wrong I mentioned, the current deployment of SADC mission, which is underway in the DRC, and the Troika, which was mentioned yesterday by the president and which the army, our army commander is chair. And again, these are best practices, but again, whether these best practices are not without any challenges, it is up to the generals who are seated here today to tell us if they are running smoothly without any encumbrances. We saw deployment also by the East African community. And now challenges, just to give a brush on them, in the picture you are able to see, on the, in the left side is the provincial minister of Lusaka looking at the food security and how the maize has dry, dried due to drought. And on the right you see the, the Kariba Dam, which provides electricity to Zambia and Zimbabwe but feeding almost five or so SADC countries. And this is the intercourse between human security and traditional security that we are looking at 
which we should not try to uh, divorce together because we talk about regional integration, what are our challenges here may not be the challenges for the best practices that we learn from Asia, for example, because they are real issues and we cannot talk about each other. You dam that, that Zambezi, it means the whole Sadiq region is affected. So when we talk about collaboration at regional level, there are issues that we should look at. What is the commander will be looking for money for his equipment, the government will be talking about how to feed the people because there is hunger due to drought. So these are the issues that we need to look at it and that we should know that we cannot divorce them. There is a nexus and a very thin line between human security and traditional security. And the lack of resources as a challenge, we saw it in the, it was mentioned at regional level. So we need cooperating partners, but what can cooperating partners bring to the table so that these challenges are lessened? Security needs differ from one country to another. The opposing goals between regional needs and those adopted bilaterally by state, non-state actors. We see at regional level that at SADC level, their emphasis is that SADC should intervene, but bilaterally, Countries enter into other alliances by maybe another force from coming from a different regional block. Is it a challenge? Are they allowed to do so? Or are they wrong? And that, again, those are answers that our commanders here should be able to provide. Issues of climate change have been mentioned already. Lack of interoperability inter uh, mentioned. And finally, mistrust, which was mentioned here, it is one very key challenge that is facing the regional uh, blocks today. These are the issues that we need to look at. So thank you very much for your attention. Merci beaucoup. Asante sana shukran jezira yekenyele amasegenalo. Thank you. Wow, thank you very much for those insightful presentations. Just to wrap up their presentations, Professor Kwesi uh, stated that regional security collaboration is important, but it must be guided by consistent application of the rules. Well, Ken Mumbi Mulenga said six, uh, he highlighted six best practices for regional security collaboration that can assist regions to overcome their security challenges. Brigadier General Dr. David Suva Sanen comes and say that he presented on the best practices, the United Nations perspective and challenges of regional security collaborations. Before I open it to the distinguished generals, maybe a question each for my panelists. For Professor Kwesi, are there any emerging threats that require new approaches to the regional security? Kenao Mumbi Mulenga. How can we share intelligence for information more effectively to counter regional security threats? Or if there is a measure for effective regional security initiatives? General Dr. Sanene. Sir, how can regional organizations effectively navigate diverse political landscapes and competing interest to foster meaningful security cooperation among the member states. Professor Kwesi. Yes, thank you, for, thank you very much. What are the emerging threats and new approaches to regional security? In West Africa per se, and the Sahel, I don't think there's anything that we can put our finger on as new. And I think people might find this surprising. In September 2009, the Security Council sent me around West Africa to try to understand what it then termed as emerging security challenges. And I traveled around most of the countries and went to Kedal in northern Mali. And the governor and I stood up in the evening and we counted 110 
Lexus 4 by 4s And I asked him, who are those wealthy people going? Then he said, oh, that is, that is Al-Qaeda. So I asked him, but how come? Can't you do something about it? He says, no, 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 no. They collect taxes. They provide social welfare. They've been married. We live here with them. The point I'm making is that when there are old security challenges and threats that we are unable to resolve, new ones are superimposed on them, they transmutate, and they become something else. Not necessarily new, but considerably stronger, much more buy-in from local communities willing to provide all kinds of support infrastructures. So for West Africa and the Sahel, we need a more robust engagement between land forces, law enforcement agencies, and other statutory institutions to extend the reach of the state. Across this subregion, there is almost no trust between different uniformed forces. Consistent contestations about areas of influence, you know, consistent fighting, and the threat as we see it is hardly ever coming from the outside. There are enough structural weaknesses and challenges that allows for the problems that these countries are, 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 are facing. Finally, there is an almost universalizing language, particularly concerning the terrorist threat moving down to the coastal areas of West Africa. I challenge that narrative. And I think we need to be bold enough to disaggregate what the types of threats are, send people to the ground, and not make assertions that are not based on the realities on the ground. And I think in, in West Africa, particularly towards the coastal states, there are too many broad assertions that are simply not correct. Thank you very much, moderator. Your, your question is revolving around the challenges connected to information sharing. This, this, this is a nagging question, I must admit, and I'll attempt to answer it by breaking it down into two. At national level, perhaps the solution would lie in encouraging interagency cooperation. One of the uh, challenges that come in the way of information sharing is mistrust. So if we have to build the trust between heads of agencies, is that we should encourage interagency operation and cooperation. Because at national level, the threat we are dealing with is national in character. And it is to the detriment of, uh, of, of a nation concerned to engage in narrow approaches to confronting this threat. So the best would be to encourage interagency cooperation and operation that is at national level. At regional level, I would propose that apart from in meeting or engaging one another, through established statutory meetings, there should be more, we should identify activities such as regional sports, where we can meet more informally and you know, engage each other at personal level, aside or rather outside seating arrangements such as this one. We can also have exchange programs in cultural you know, issues and so on. What actually makes it so difficult to share this information is that we are always meeting in very official engagements. Mm. So 
it means this information, again, can only be passed using official channels, and we all know how bureaucratic that can be. So that would be my, my, my quick response to that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on the question on how the regional groupings can navigate through the identified um, challenges uh, and have the best practices. Uh, I think one of the issues is that uh, countries within a regional grouping need to be open to each other. And apart from being open to each other, there has to be a framework a legal framework which would direct one member of the grouping to adhere to certain uh, regularities on how to do uh, business. Because, for example, again, it is very difficult because if a regional force is deployed somewhere where there is strife and the host country sees that that regional force is not doing much as it is supposed to be. It is very difficult for other members of that regional grouping to dictate to them that they should not engage another country, for example, to come and help them and operating at a very different mandate. This force is on a different mandate Bilaterally, the force that has come from a different country has a separate mandate altogether. So it brings a lot of problems, and to resolve that, the commanders who are here need to talk to each other, need to agree, and have a framework where if they are faced with such a conundrum, they will be able to know how to uh, go about it so that there are certain restrictions that this member state perhaps before engaging another member state coming from a different block um, to come in to operate on the same operational sphere, they should be informed that the issue of information sharing, that colleagues, I think we've seen that you are toothless, we are going to bring in someone else, do you agree or you don't agree? And then they should be able to agree. They should be able to reach some consensus. Otherwise, these problems are going to be there throughout. And we are going to be talking about them here. And it will end up as an academic exercise without any pragmatic uh, solution at all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for all those uh, responses.